Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Long Pots of Friday, and today we're going to be reading a little story known as, In My Mind, Darkness Waits. It's a sequel to a previous post that I'd done on this channel, and once again, we're going to revisit it. So without further ado, let's begin. To you, my listener. So, I know it's been a while, and I know that I said this thing wouldn't drive me to much hysteria again, but... It's just gotten way too real now. With, without getting into too much detail yet, it's becoming more than just an annoyance. More than just something I can write off as my own subconscious being unruly. There's hours of night I hold so dearly. It's become frightening. Very, very frightening. I, I, I'm almost afraid to sleep now. I've never been afraid to sleep. Not since my earliest years, not after horror films or scary stories. Or anything, really. I don't have nightmares. I, I just don't. They're not possible. Not when I have full control of what I see, hear, touch, smell, as I taste and I dream. So, with that being said, what in the hell is making my dream such a fucking damn nightmare? <sighs> I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. First, I should probably give you a little bit of backstory of my life. Not my life story, just something that I'm starting to realize has significance now. In my days, I spent huddled in my bed sleeping for the first time in my short existence. This isn't going to be some revelation that I was abused as a child or that I was a witness to some form of horror that a child should never see. This is just... Something more tragic than horrible, I guess. Causing more sadness than outrage. Something that had a massive impact on my life and is indeed currently having a bigger impact than I ever thought would be possible. My mother and her tragic passing. Now, don't get me wrong, I was incredibly young when she passed, but as little about her as I personally experienced, I still feel like I knew her. This was mostly due to my father, considering he raised me basically from birth alone. He had every night from then on to deal with me if I woke up and started crying. And as my childhood gift was more of a curse than a boon, imagine what combination of natural lucid dreaming plus scared toddler equals. This was the only time I actually can say I physically remember having these nightmares. But nonetheless, only looking back on it now, I realize how much sleep he must have lost on this. One thing this increase of increased nighttime visits to my room allowed for was for him to tell me some stories. And his favorite topic was my mother. Of course, only once I was old enough to understand the stories he had. So as a result of this, I have a good bit of knowledge about her. Or at least, to know what a wonderful woman she was. And... As a result, I think I grieved for her much later in my life than when she had been taken away from us. I was around a week old when she died, so naturally I don't remember anything about her from way back when. It was my father who filled in the blanks. He would take me up onto his knee, tell me stories about her, I would listen intently, holding a small locket he religiously wore around his neck. He had a picture in it of my mother's face. Smiling, a warm, glowing smile. Honestly, it's one of the happiest damn pictures of a girl you could ever find. He told me of how they had gone to Malin Head or north of Dangal, and how they spent their days just lying in the sand looking at the wispy clouds on, on one of those rare sunny days in the part of Ireland that they happened to be living at. This was a couple of months before I personally had been conceived, and one of the moments I personally returned to in my dreams most days when stress or just some other factor pushed me a little further than comfortable, even if I had to take naps throughout the day just to see it. She was, from my father's stories, a incredible woman, a midwife, and one of the local hospital's finest at that. My father told me about how she'd been catapulted up the ranks when the head of the department had been, at the time, injured in an accident and named, and she had been named as her replacement. For the time, she had to take time to heal. It wasn't supposed to be her though, but the woman insisted. So naturally, my mother had accepted by throwing herself into the head position and, according to my father, rising to the occasion. 
The moral of the story is, my mother was a take charge woman, someone who would, when seeing a position that needed filling, she would be the one to first volunteer. Uh, a quote from my father would actually have to be, I've never seen her so absorbed as when she was sitting there, my father would say, pointing at his desk in the corner of the room by the balcony doors. She would be working through big piles of paperwork, patient files. I would fall asleep and wake up the next morning to see her lying face down, uh, some expecting the mother's file to be fast asleep, with the ink on paper shading her forehead. And to be honest, at that part I used to laugh. So when the old head of the department had to retire due to her injuries, my mother had to stay on. From there, I've been told a few different accounts of her work after that. But the common one and common theme is that she delivered a quarter of our small country's newborns personally, and had earned the love of each of those families. I've even seen stacks of old Christmas cards that she used to keep in an old file of pictures that she'd been sent from many of their newborn babies. Even the old baskets of many fruit muffins and hampers that these new, newly happy families would send. In, t in a town as small as we lived in, this kind of thing made you feel like a local hero, so to speak. But according to my dad, she never let it get to her head. People would smile and stop her to street to chat, or invite her and my father out for dinner just because they had been the one to deliver their new bundle of joy into the world safely. But one thing my father later admitted was that he suspected my mother's dedication came out of something that was much more personal than simple ambition or love of the people or love of the community. They had been trying to get a baby for themselves for years of quite little success, and he had a feeling that she was committed to her job because she had a sort of substitute child that she couldn't find for herself. I, I remember his voice when he said this, a, a strange mixture of nostalgia yet also remorse with a hint of unreasonable guilt. He knew he said, he knew what he said and that wasn't his fault, nor was it hers for that matter, but still he had a little bit of guilt, as irrational as it was. That she had gone without a child of her own as long as she did, and whenever she finally managed to get, well, me, it was kind of too late. And she never really got to see her new child as much as I, I guess she would want to. He smiled warmly at this point. It used to bring him happy tears, and even though the situation was quite sad. He never saw her as absolutely happy as the day that she found out she was expecting, and to be honest, it's kind of tragic how when she finally has a baby, it's too late. And I, I guess that's just kind of the sad facts of reality. But the most important discoveries I made about my mother, and the thing that finally came to terms with her loss, was her diary. A small, leather-bound, elegant book that I still cherish under my bed. I'm holding it right now as I write this, and I even find myself smiling as I thumb through the old pictures and squirrely writing, and I find comfort in it. More comfort than anything else I've ever tried in the last few days, which is kind of odd considering what I'm about to tell you, and at first I was apprehensive to take it, but... When I stumbled across it, looking for a pen, it was in my mother's old writing desk, at the bottom of one of the lower drawers. I had hesitated, but my fingers inches from the worn leather, I, I just... She was my mother too, and... Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe it was just I didn't want to breach her privacy like that, it being her diary after all, but something made me take it anyway, just even to have it. It had a lock on it, and... Well, even if I wanted to read it, I probably couldn't without a proper locksmith. It's only recently that I accessed any of its contents. It had fallen, you see, and hit the hard wooden floor of my apartment's bedroom floor fairly hard. When I found it, the little padlock had been shattered by the impact, and its old pages had been slightly scuffed as the parts near the end. I couldn't read it. I, I know I shouldn't have, but... And I, and I know how wrong it may seem to you by reading something as bold as my own mother's private thoughts, but as guilty as I felt, there is something more important right now than me kicking myself for being a bad person. 
and that, listeners, is that the pages is in the pages that were opened when I found it. You see, originally I, I meant to read the thing, and all I meant to do was try to smooth out the pages that had been crumpled when it fell. The ones near the back of the book, at least. But I had absentmindedly been smoothing out the pages at the start, and I'd been reading the date. It was about a week into what memory serves me correct as the first month of my mother's pregnancy, aka around the time my, f my mother would have found out that she was going to have me. Now, bear in mind, around this time, that thing really had been rearing its ugly head in my dreams, and had been getting more and more active, moving and walking around and interacting with people around it. Close to this point, it had started hurting them, tripping them down the stairs, simply beating them aside with a fury of arm waves. It even killed a few, simply lashing out tendril-like appendages out of the dark substance that it was his body. It made crushing them or impaling them. I, I won't go into do t more detail for my sake rather than yours, even though I know you horror junkies out there can handle such things. My dreams have been becoming more and more of a dangerous place as I go about my fucking days. And... <sighs> but naturally, I was pretty freaked out back then, and because of this, I found myself remembering back to what my father had said about how happy my mother had been when she found out that she was expecting. I, I wanted to read her the entry from back then, but I didn't know the date, so I started from the page I was fixing, and you have no idea how much I regret reading what I read. You do not know the sheer terror that brings back as I sit there as I'm... As right now I'm writing this, remembering it all in detail for you now. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't scared for my very life. I, I wouldn't be reading this out loud to you if I wasn't worried that I was in danger. And I am only fearful because of what I read in the last entries, and I, I, I'd rather just read it to you, and that will illustrate my point the best. January 1st, 1991. Dear Diary, You wouldn't believe the day I have had. Patient 184, Miss Maria Nightingale, had left us. She died last night around 3 in the morning. After she took her private room for monitoring, she had given birth to a healthy, little, sickly-looking girl, and within the space of an hour, we had to restrain Maria. Something must have been terribly wrong with that woman, because I've never seen such a case of post-natal psychosis. I've never in all my years, I swear, it was like a switch. I wasn't there for the birth, but I saw her once or twice, and he seemed fine. The next thing I knew is that I was being told that she was screaming, raving about something in the corner room, saying that it was watching me and I have failed it. And the most disturbing thing of all that she said was, don't let it kill me. Naturally, I rushed there as soon as I could, but by the time I had been there, she'd been sedated to sleep. I told the others to leave and that was that. I had a free schedule. Anyway, so... So I thought I, I might as well make myself useful, and to be honest, I kind of wish I had it. She woke up around half one, and I didn't get to her till around two. I, I could see her, her in distress and the sheer terror on her face. I got there and sent Trisha off, and she was more than happy to leave. She explained to Maria had been trying to tell her that, what, that there was a monster in the room with her and that she had been trying to describe it. Trisha gave her a piece of paper and pen, and the woman had been scribbling ever since. This woman was in her early 30s, and she was believing in some petty little things. And I don't know. I mean, like, the look on her terror on her face... Well, terror on her face is... It's hard to even describe. She kept glancing up at the far corner of the room, then back at the pages, then back at the far corner of the room again, and I asked her what she was drawing, and the only thing she would reply was with it, and it, and she kept on repeating herself over and over again. She shouted, you can't see it either, damn it, and she turned to the corner again, and this is verbatim what she said. 
What the hell are you? I, I can't change it. I can't. I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. Just don't hurt her. Just don't hurt Viola. Naturally, I restrained her and took the paper away, trying to calm her down. When she saw the sedative again, she started screaming and squirming. Please don't put me to sleep again. Please, just, just don't do it. She kept on screaming at me. I didn't really want to put her through any more stress. And she was just a kid after all. But there were other patients in the room around her, so I just gave her the injection and waited for her to sleep again. Just before she nodded off, though, she jolted wide awake, whim whimpering at me in tears in her eyes, saying, Oh, God, no. God, it's coming after you now. I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. It needs me. I know. Then she drifted off, freaked out at me, and that was the end. <sighs> she sounded like she truly believed in what she had done, and somehow believed that she'd done something to harm me. I couldn't stop staring at the picture she drew, though, and no wonder the woman was distressed if this is what she saw seeing in her delusions. I... Now, me... <sighs> me being me, I, I understand her terror. Those eyes, that mouth would be enough to make you shiver. That big black man... That, that thing... I, it, with those eyes and those mouth... <sighs> the thing that she had described and scribbled was the thing I have been seeing in my dreams out of the corner of my eyes over and over again. And what was the bit at the end where she started talking about me? Oh, well, I, I can't exactly ask her since her heart gave out as she slept. She must have been in worse shape after birth than we honestly thought. Shame on her daughter though. Her daughter was so pretty she didn't really give an official name to the poor girl, but she said it was Viola, or at least she said it was when she was shouting the name. Viola was. Viola Nightingale. It has a ring to it. Her father couldn't be found, so she's going to be going to her legal guardians, her aunt and uncle, I think. Still, I won't be sleeping tonight. All this was rather creepy. On a unrelated note, I am feeling a bit odd these days, and in short of breath a lot. Like, when I climb the stairs at work, I feel like I'm going to be sick in the morning yesterday. My back was too sore, and I really needed to get more sleep, and uh, I, I might check myself in soon. Well, this is the end of the diary, Meredith. Now, I don't think I need to point out the horrific little tidbit there at the end of the entry, do I? That, that sounds like a lot, like the thing in my head. And I'm, I'm sorry to bloody panic, I, because I've never seen such a goddamn page before, and yet I'm seeing what sounds like the exact same thing this woman has been seeing before she died. She died. And from the sounds of it, she's seen the same thing that I had been seeing before, too. She'd been seeing the same thing before she had her child, and it sounded like she was trying to apologize to it. For But for what, though? What would do something like that? I have no idea. I honestly don't. Regardless, it, it's been getting worse since I read it. It looks happier, almost... Its outline looks a little bit more distinct. It's gotten more solid and less ethereal, and I've been trying to avoid it now and hide from it, and it slaughters of pe pedestrians until it finds me. And when it does... All it does is smile, wave, and stare, unblinking. I even tried pulling a damn Inception-style moving world crap, but it didn't work. I made the wall appear in its way, and it just walks through it. It, it made the street fill with fast-moving cars. It, it walks through them, too. Just late last night, I made a bus drive directly behind me, blocking it from, its, from my line of sight, and it uses tendrils to pick up the bus and throw it out of the way. I panicked, I screamed at it, I shouted it, I cursed at it. I even tried bringing the bus back, but I couldn't. The more this thing is in my dream, and the later that the night goes on, the more control I feel it has of the dream. But all this is meaningless to what happens, last, happens next. I shouted at it one night for the last time, What do you want from me? And 
It cocked its head from one side to the other and then smiled wider before walking closer, close enough to where it could have reached out and touched me, and it said, I want the same thing I always have. The same thing I wanted from your mother when I found her all those years ago. I want you, John. It laughed that silky laugh, sounding much like much more evil now, and rather in a seductive tone almost. I whimpered. What do you mean? It stared back at me with those unblinking glowing eyes and finally said, All in good time, my dear boy. Soon you will understand. Like I said years ago, in that old house, like I said to your mother when you were born, I've been waiting ages for you. And that after that, it walked away. But as it did, it turned to me one more last time. And it chuckled. It said... It is a pity, though. I would have liked your mother to be around for this. Pity she reached. Pity she reacted too badly when I told her. It is a shame. Oh, well. Eggs and omelets, I suppose. See you tomorrow. Night, John. Now wake up, sleepyhead. At that point, I woke screaming. You'll never... You see, I, I never told you how my mother died. She fell off her balcony one day after she was released from the hospital. I need some time away. I I'm going home. Back to my father. Maybe he can help me shed some light on this. I'll write back soon, once I have my head on straight. To you, my readers, John Black. And that was, in my mind, Darkness Waits, by my good friend Johnny Black. Now, I can't tell you how much I have to say this, but this is one of the best creepypastas I've ever read. The only thing that I would write off as a complaint is that the writing is disjointed at certain points, and the actual um, payoff for the scares is not that well but as a story this is just flat out fantastic there's great build up we're getting good character development there's not any cliches as far as i can see the main character is someone you can relate with uh see yourself being in that situation and all in all this is just a flat out amazing creepypasta and i can honestly see this becoming a classic like pen pals which i hope to do in the future on this channel I hope you guys really enjoy this reading, and if you don't understand what's going on, well, I don't understand why, because this is pretty much self-contained, but the prequel to this story will be somewhere in an annotation. I did that. Ta tops off to Mr. Creepypasta, who helped me collab on this uh, story. Thank you guys for continuing supporting me and all that fun stuff, but this is just a fucking fantastic Creepypasta, and there, I cannot stop giving it praise. Only, again, thing that was bad is the disjointed writing, which you guys who are listening to me narrate it will not hear at all. So, credit to the author, and with that being said, I'm going to have to say that this has been That Creepy Reading, signing off.